Hello once again. Thanks for joining us. My name is Andrew Dunkley, the host of this here podcast called Space Nuts. Great to have your company. I hope you're well. Coming up on this edition, an unusual planet formation discovered. What's that mean? Well, this is a planet that's being born a very different way, it appears, and a spacecraft that's going to be built of Lego. Ish. Ish, could be, and uh, much, much more. A couple of questions. Oh, look, a black hole question. How different? And uh, we're going to talk about temperature and uh, spacecraft that are exposed to the sun and how they protect them. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. It's so good to have your company. Thanks for joining us on episode 299. We are one short of 300, but apparently we're all away next week, so we're not going to do it. (laughs) And joining me as always to talk astronomy and space science is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing today? I am well. What about you? How are you recovering from your (laughs) exposure to the dreaded COVID-19? Yeah, it's a slow process. Um, I'm doing okay. Feeling fine, generally. Just... You're just aware that something's not quite right. Mm. A little bit of congestion, perhaps, and things of that sort. But no, I'm okay. Everyone I've spoken to who's had it has reported some kind of different after effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've spoken to people who've just had a little bit of, you know, baby brain, if I can call it that. They're just not, they can't stay focused. Uh, Energy, loss of energy is is a big one. Um, Persistent cough, um, just a little bit of heavy breathing type of stuff. None of that, you know, nasty stuff on the phone, but um, (laughs) just the, just the, a little bit of trouble with normal breathing, that, that kind of thing. Everyone's got a different story which I find fascinating but disturbing all at the same time. (laughs) Okay, Fred, um, I'm glad you're on the mend. That's the good news. I think so, yes. Now, uh, for those who are wondering what's going to happen with episode 300 next week, we have a plan, which I will tell you later because we want to get to our first story. I'll just put that on the bottom of my run sheet so I don't forget. Uh, but uh, an unusual planet formation has been discovered. Was this the the one I heard about that was through Hubble? Yes, it's a Hubble Hubble discovery. Okay. Um, as these things often are. Um, and and it's, it's one of these stories that um, doesn't exactly upend what we know already, but it certainly, um, you know, it certainly uh, casts a new light on the way we think things work in space. So you and I have talked many times before, Andrew, about planet formation. Mm. And the, uh, the, 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 the standard method is something that's usually called the core accretion method. So um, what you get <clears throat> is uh, bits and pieces sticking together, uh, small objects, basically bits of dust to start with that gradually stick together. That's what the accretion means. It's things sticking together uh, and uh, forming eventually solid lumps. And eventually those solid lumps come together to form uh, what are called planetesimals, which might be a couple of hundred kilometres across. And then they too stick together uh, to form protoplanets, which might be, you know, the size of Mars or the size of the moon or something that uh, which eventually collapsed to, to, to form the core of planets and I think in this specific case Andrew we're talking about gas giants the likes of Jupiter the big planets uh, how they yep. how they formed so the core accretion uh, method is the standard way that we think planets planets of this kind were formed however some new observations which have come from direct imaging, uh, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, long may it continue. It's still doing fabulous work. Uh, that that seems to be, and it's a protoplanet um, that's forming through a different method, um, which is being called disk instability. So core accretion is the normal one that we think we we, we observe. Disk instability is what the researchers themselves describe 
as an intense and violent process because core accretion is a fairly gentle process there are collisions involved things smash into each other and you know forms debris again and then the debris re-sticks together but generally speaking the coming together of bits and pieces is relatively slow it's uh, uh it's as these you know these objects um come together under their own mutual gravity and eventually, um, you know, there's so many of them that, that, that they, they heat up and that forms a kind of melting that, that allows the things to stick together. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a violent process, whereas disk instability seems to be. So what are the observations about? Well, it's a planet around a star called AB Origi, uh, which is in the constellation of Origa the Charioteer, which is a Northern Hemisphere constellation. It's right right above Orion in the Northern Hemisphere. And its brightest star is Capella, which is actually a sun-like star. Uh, but AB or Origi is actually a variable star, uh, which is why it's got that slightly peculiar name. Um, and it is, we can see, a disk uh, of... Um, protoplanetary material so one of these protoplanetary disks which we've talked about many times before usually because of observations from the ALMA uh, Atacama Large Millimeter Array uh, but as I said these are Hubble uh, observations uh, they've used a space telescope imaging spectrograph and their near and infrared camera and multi-object spectrograph so these are two different instruments on Hubble that have been used um, in fact in, co uh, in connection too with instruments on the Subaru telescope. That's the 8.2 metre telescope operated by Japan at Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So this is they're coming together of some of the world's great facilities, the Hubble mm. and Subaru. Uh, and what's been observed is this disk. Now, <clears throat> we're very fortunate in this case because this protoplanetary disk is actually face on uh, to our line of sight. So we can see it sort of almost in plan andrew you, you know kind of mapped out um uh, for for anybody to see and what what um has been detected is a structure in the protoplanetary disk which includes um one very bright part that is being interpreted because of the observations the spectroscopic observations as this process of this violent and what was it the, the expression an intense and violent process uh, a planet forming by uh, disk instability uh, it's, it appears as a bright spot in the images that we've seen uh there is a lot of uh emphasis on exactly what is being seen here uh, because uh, if you can observe over a long period and they they have done um which is actually one of the reasons why the hubble telescope has been used for this they've, they've observed this thing with the hubble over a period of 13 years that allows you to see the orbital motion of this thing uh, so you can actually see this planet moving in its orbit over only a small distance because it's a long way from its parent star. Yeah. Um, it's about three times as far away as Neptune is uh, from the sun. So it's way out in the depths of its solar system. Uh, but the motion has nevertheless been detected. And this process that's going on has also been detected spectroscopically. So it's an exciting, an exciting result. Yeah, it's uh, it's also something we've caught in the early stages yeah. of solar system formation. I mean, you compare the age of our solar system to what's been discovered. Yes, and, that's right. Uh, it's yeah, it's quite young. Two million, two million years old, they reckon. Yeah, compared with uh, 4.57 billion years for our solar system. So we are talking about two very different, you know, epochs or periods in, in planet formation. But I no, suppose it's... people would find it surprising that uh, planet formation uh, is still sort of in early phases in some parts of the universe. But I, I guess if the universe continues to expand, there are always going to be well, not always because it's all going to end one day, but uh, there's going to be these processes happening at different stages. Yes, that's the great thing about astronomy. You know, we look out into space and we can see all these phenomena happening uh, at different phases. It's why we know so much about the way stars evolve, Andrew, because we can, we can observe stars uh, at different phases in their lifetimes, from the youngest to the oldest, uh, and indeed even beyond the grave, we can see them because we can see black holes. Yes. So yeah. So it's uh, it's it's a really um, 
it, it's one of the you know you know one of the attributes of astronomy that you you can look at many many different objects and we can see all these all these different phenomena and planetary formation of course is one of the hot topics uh, in astronomy at the moment so it's very much uh, in the forefront of, of uh, the, the the research field uh, look at looking at the way planets form and this is a very nice story that comes directly into that um, you know into that arena now you you said because of the angle, we can actually see it um, sort of side on. Someone's going to ask why that's possible given everything sort of spreads out on a plane in the universe, uh, or does it? <laughs> well, uh, not really, no. So things, you know, we see things at different angles. Galaxies come at different angles, which is why some of those we see face on, some we see edge on, some we see okay. in between. Um, it's a mishmash. And, and the same, so this is an object in our galaxy, um, and we're we're observing it just at exactly the right angle to see the disc uh, face on, and that will be the case for a few million years yet. Mm. Uh, so we're not going to lose that uh, you know that angle that, uh, that that it presents to us. Not for so, a while anyway. Yeah. Okay. We're saying this one's two million years old. When will it be at a point where it's I don't know um, a normal solar system that, that's a great question and it's well, once again that's the uh, subject of debate how long does planet formation take and uh, the current thinking is that it's a pretty rapid process that mm. you know the planets um, if you look at our own solar system for example as i said 4.57 billion years old but we think that the planets as we know them today would have been formed within the first one or two hundred million years of that of that time. That it, it's a really early, you know, a really rapid process at, at the start of a, a solar system's life. Uh, gets all the nitty gritty ironed out. There, there would have been. Uh, we know that there was a, a phase, probably, um, you know, five hundred million years later, maybe six hundred million years later, where everything was charging around and. Uh, everything was colliding into everything else uh, a period that we call the late heavy bombardment and that uh, that late heavy bombardment also stirred things up a lot um, what caused most of the craters on the moon for example uh, but even then you know it was it was relatively small chunks leftover bits of debris that were that were charging around not not big protoplanets themselves fascinating I've just done a quick calculation and oh, good. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if you you're right to- if you're right, or oh, I had to work it out, probably wrong. My mathematics sucks. But uh, if you're right about it taking about 200 million years for the solar system to form, we will be able to report on it on episode 10 billion of Space Nuts. Okay. Uh, that's something to look forward to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Mm, all right. <laughs> are, you we'll sure, there. are you sure it's not? Uh, episode minus 10 billion that we would be reporting on it because we would have a grandstand seat in front of all the action for that. Yes, we would. Could be. <laughs> that's that's a good thought and also very confusing. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, we have been building up to this for quite some time and it is now time to tell you what the plan is for our 300th episode, which is coming up next week. Next week, you'll be able to tune in live and listen to Space Nuts and uh, join us um, person to person, basically, which uh, we have done as an experiment um, a couple of times, but this is the first official live program. Uh, for Space Nuts to celebrate 300 episodes, and yeah, it's it's a milestone that uh, n- neither of us ever expected to achieve. So it's it's been amazing, and all because of your support. So thank you very much. But he- here's the plan for episode 300: there will be bloopers. <laughs> Somebody asked us for bloopers. We we haven't actually got many, but um, I, I did find a few, and Fred sent me one that I didn't know existed, so uh, we're going to chuck them in. Uh, we will be offering you the opportunities to send us live questions, probably through the Facebook uh, page, so that uh, we can answer them on the fly. Uh, we're working on a special guest. The original idea fell through, but we've got another idea, so we, we may go ahead with that. It's not absolutely necessary, so we will probably just um, make a decision on that as the week progresses. But um, it, yeah, we'll just um, keep it 
sort of on the back burner. Uh, there will be giveaways. Yep, we're going to do some giveaways. There will be a game of skill involved, so you better have your ducks lined up. So uh, And, and uh, we'll tell you how to win on the day. Now, what time is this happening? That's the most important thing. Uh, we're going to give you the uh, time in, in um, International Universal Time so that you can convert it to your local time zone. Otherwise, it's just going to get very confusing. So it will be Monday, 11.30 p.m. Universal Time or 23.30 if you like. So Universal Time, 23.30 on Monday that is next week for episode 300 of Space Nuts. So I hope you can join us live. It will be at this stage on Facebook and it will be on the other thing, YouTube. Sorry. Yeah, YouTube. So Facebook and YouTube will be carrying it. We are looking at other platforms at this stage. We're going to post all this on Facebook, of course, but um, just uh, assume YouTube and Facebook at this point in time. Uh, if we add any more like Instagram, uh, we'll let you know. But Monday, 23.30 hours, Universal International Universal Time for episode 300 of Space Nuts live and in person. Really looking forward to having you join us then. Fred, let's move on to our next, next story. And um, this one seems to have a lot of elements to it. Uh, but they're looking at um, building this massive space station. You, says, you suggested out of Lego, but not real Lego probably. <laughs> no, <it's not. clears throat> but um, are they also looking at artificial gravity in this experiment? That's right. So that's what this is all about. Um, it's, it's how you can, um, you know, uh, transfer the idea of a spinning space station into reality uh, pro to provide gravitational, simulated gravity for its occupants. And of course, this all goes back um, decades. Um, the, um, I'm sure many of our listeners will remember the, the rotating space station in 2001, A Space Odyssey, mm. uh, which you know, was right on the money as to, as to how you might do this. Um, and, and it's a, an idea that's been studied in great detail. In fact, uh, a few years ago, I had the um, pleasure of talking to uh, a gentleman. It's actually um, Linda Spilker's husband. You remember Linda Spilker, who was the mission scientist for, project scientist for Cassini? Yes. Her husband uh, actually owns or runs a company that looks at exactly this sort of phenomenon, the idea of providing artificial gravity. And I had some really interesting talks with him about, about you know, the limits, the limits on how uh, how how well this would work, and it turns out that um, if you so you what you've got is some sort of disc, and the humans uh, are around the edge of it, or other objects that you want to put into artificial gravity. But it turns out that if you if you spin it at much more than about um, three revs per minute, then everybody gets sick because oh. uh, you you know it's just, you're just like in in a washing machine, um, and so. What you have to do is spin it at a slow speed, um, and the slow speed then dictates that you're talking about something big. You're not talking about a, a, you know a disc that's twenty feet across. Yeah. You're talking about something a kilometer across, uh, so that you get the you know you get the proper effect of gravity uh, on uh, on on scales that that are that don't make you sick basically. And so um, what this story is about is uh, it's really just a progress report, I guess, on um, projects that are being looked at through the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts, NIAC, uh, and they, they basically issue grants to universities and things like that. And, and two of these grants have gone to um, uh, teams at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Washington. Uh, for basically clever ideas about how you can build a kilometre scale space station, which will rotate and have um, have you know artificial gravity. Yeah. Um, now, kilometre long structures are not things that you can carry up easily on spacecraft unless you're very clever about the kind of technologies that you would use, and that's really what this is all about. It's the structures and 
you're quite right. It's not it's not Lego like things. It's basically uh, structures that fold up to be very very compact. Uh, More but, like a Meccano set. Yeah, that sort of thing. That's right. If you, um, I mean, I remember making Meccano bits and oh, pieces that me too. <laughs> usually, I love that stuff. Yeah, it was great. Um, but um, so that there is a technical term for the kind of thing uh, that we're talking about, uh, which is a high expansion ratio deployable structure or a herds H E R D S, which is quite a nice uh, uh you know a nice um, acronym for for yeah. this sort of thing so what I do we mean i i hadn't heard of that no i hadn't either <laughs> uh i hadn't heard of it thank you andrew that's a very nice uh a very nice pun there that uh, went right it's over not my it's not a very nice pun at all 15 seconds terrible <laughs> <laughs> there must be another one in there. Oh, oh this, look, these don't are start me. herds of ideas come this way. Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> but the, the name tells you what moving right along. Yes, high expansion ratio deployable structure. So high expansion ratio means um, it's the ratio between what it's like when it's folded up and when it's not, <laughs> um, and it's it's a very high ratio, and you know probably with numbers in the hundreds. So you know this thing gets hundreds of times bigger uh, mm. when you when you press the button and it is deployed. That's the deployable structure bit, and so. Um, there's actually uh, there's actually a really nice piece which I think was originally on Universe Today. I saw it on um, on SciTech Daily, uh, which has got some videos of some of these structures uh, being used uh, or being deployed. Um, uh, you know where you basically you you press a button uh, or release something and it springs into action. It's a bit like. Um, yeah, I guess the, a nice way to think of it is when you press the button on an umbrella that opens up on its own. Yeah. You click the button and suddenly it's gone from a long stick uh, into something that's going to keep the rain off you. And that's very appropriate as I speak because it's pouring down again here in Sydney. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, once again, the gutters are overflowing. Anyway, never mind all that. Um, it's, it, if we were outside, it would be very nice to have an umbrella in this weather. And that that's basically, uh, I guess, a herd's uh, an example of a herds uh, high expansion ratio deployable structure. Whoops, sorry. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think this is really promising. I love the idea of creating large space stations. I've kind of rambled on about this before because, you know, if you want to colonize space, the way to do it is by building these large art, um, artificial structures. You provide your own gravity, uh, and uh, you you essentially allow the uh, allow the the, the 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 engineering to dictate where you're going rather than the fact that you've got an, a nice earth-like planet next door similar to earth next door yeah, for example mars which is why i don't think we should be colonizing mars i think yeah. we should be building herds in space there you yes go. <laughs> yes fair enough i did see uh, an interesting science fiction solution to the artificial uh, artificial gravity problem uh, in the tv series the expanse which i thoroughly enjoyed what okay. a great show yep. uh the special effects were amazing but they, they didn't have artificial gravity on most of their spacecraft uh, but they did have uh, electromagnetic boots. Okay. <laughs> and and you, and the floors were all made of metal. metal so yeah, you yeah. just turned the boots on and you could walk around. Yeah. I think, you know... Com- I, I think the problem with that is if you were in space long enough, the muscle wastage would eventually make it more and more difficult for you mm. to walk with magnetic boots. That's the only problem I can see with it. So um, when... When we were in uh, COVID lockdown last week, uh, we explored the extremes of of uh, what's available on on TV on the web, yeah. and and I picked out what because I wanted to pick out one of my favourites, mm. and so we wound up with Wallace and Gromit. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know whether you remember, but one of the episodes of Wallace and Gromit is called The Wrong Trousers, and it's got exactly what you're talking about there, except they weren't magnetic. They were they were vacuum-operated, a bit like flies' feet, I guess. Oh, you know, right. suckers on the bottom of your trousers, allowing you to walk along ceilings and things of that sort. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure that's such Such clever stuff. Though. Yeah. Uh, well, the the latest uh, science fiction series that I've attached myself to because I used to play the game with the boys when they were young 
is Halo. Yeah, well, Halo's the classic example of a rotating structure. Yes. It's and brilliant. The, the, um, the critics have been pretty uh, nasty with the TV series okay. of Halo. Yeah, didn't and a lot much. of the purists are saying, oh, you know, mm. but um, I'm just taking it on face value. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm really loving it. And the special effects are magnificent. That sounds great. So, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I can relate to uh, the characters because they're all straight out of the game. Yes. There's a, there's a couple in there. I, the only thing that disappointed me is uh, when the, the very first edition of the Halo game when it came out started with a movie role um, introducing us to um, the Master Chief, but also the sp- uh, spaceship, the battle cruiser he was on called the Pillar of Autumn. I loved the names of things in it, the Pillar of Autumn. Uh, it was a great name. Uh, but they didn't start it that way. They started on this planet we'd never heard of with these characters that we never heard of. So maybe that put people off initially. Mm-hmm. And guess what they were mining on this planet? Uh, You'll never get it. Wouldn't be cheese, would it? No, deuterium. <laughs> oh, deuterium. Yeah. I don't know what they wanted to use it heavy for. Water. They, yeah. they never explained that, but it was well, a highly heavy, sought heavy after commodity. Heavy yeah, hydrogen, possibly. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, anyway, uh, and I'm also interested to see that China is very keen on this experiment. They're um, mm-hmm. they're obviously keen to get artificial gravity solved as well. I guess anybody who's going into space would like to solve it. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> mm. Okay, we'll leave it there for the moment, but if you want to chase that story up, it's on SciTechDaily.com. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Space Nuts. And if you would like to become a patron of Space Nuts, you can do so by logging onto our website and look at the options. There are all sorts of ways of supporting us uh, financially or just by uh, buying us a cup of coffee, which you can do on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Or uh, you can um, leave a review on whichever podcast platform you use. Uh, Reviews are very, very helpful. Uh, they just help to spread the word. Apparently, the more reviews, the higher up the chain we go in the in the scheme of things, and more people can find us. So those are options. Uh, but yeah, thanks to the patrons. Uh, I, I haven't looked on the patron list uh, lately, but the numbers have jumped. So thank you very, very much for joining us as patrons. We really, really do appreciate it. Uh, now, Fred. Um, Let's get into some questions. This one's a a very quick question from Simon. Hello, Fred and Andrew. This is Simon here from Sweden again. If gravity has an infinite reach, would that mean that all that exists would eventually end up in a single black hole? Thanks. Keep it up. Oh, that was quick, but it's a a deep question. It is very profound. So what um, balances gravity uh, is, is motion and... That's why, uh, you know, black holes don't just sit there and suck up everything Mm. uh, because um, we know from observations in our own galaxy that uh, there are stars in orbit around the black hole at the centre of our galaxy. We can see them um, moving around and they're at no risk at all of being sucked in by it. So uh, as long as you've got things moving around um, and everything moves, uh, then uh, there's there's not going to be a situation where a black hole will suck everything in. Plus the fact that, as as you and I have spoken about many times, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So uh, everything is, you know, if you think of a a single random black hole somewhere, on the larger scale, things are moving away from it uh, because they've been carried away by the expansion of the universe. So I think the answer is no. Uh, the, The entire contents of the universe will not ever be sucked in by a black hole. But Simon's right. Um, gravity is uh, one of those forces that uh, basically has infinite reach. It, it gets, it, you know, it um, reduces by the inverse square law. Uh, when you go twice as far away, it reduces by a factor of four. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it, you know, at some level, it's always there. So, yeah. um, but it's not ever going to be a situation where it, uh, it will, you know, the gravity of a single black hole will suck everything into it. Mm. Well, I think I, I think we've talked about the end of the universe before, and uh, early theories were the Gnab Gib, the big yes, you know, right. crush, uh, which is the reverse of black hole, uh, big uh, of uh, Big Bang. But yeah. um, the, the latest, <coughs> excuse me, theory is, <coughs> excuse me again, 
uh, is that uh, it will just complete, uh, com- continue to expand and there could be a big rip or we'll just move so far away from each other we'll all just, you know, eventually just be cold, dead rocks in space. That's right. <clears throat> and that's going to happen. That's going to happen next week, just before we're about to start episode three hundred. <laughs> Darn it! That'll solve a lot of problems, huh? Um, yeah, the big rip would solve a few, wouldn't it? Yeah, it probably would. Yeah, but if we had, if there was a big rip, let's say it happened right now, how quickly would we know about it? Um, <laughs> I, so the big rip is is when space time itself gets torn apart, uh, and and before that happens, the atoms have been torn apart. So we, we're already, you know, we're already curtains. Uh, but we don't before, have to worry about that. So we don't have to worry about the big rip. That's right. That's good. <laughs> That's uh, the good news. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Simon, for your question. Great to hear from you. Let's uh, now get a couple of questions from Ralph. Hello, Top Nuts. This is Ralph in Northern California again. A couple quick questions. I'm sitting here in the warm California sun. feels great on my neck and back, and I'm thinking, gosh, when our planet revolves to the other side and I don't get the direct energy from our nearby star, it gets much cooler, of course, and even cold at times up here. And I'm thinking, is that the same when you get above the atmosphere it's out away from the uh, greenhouse effect do you still get a very hot energy um, effect from direct sunlight and then when you're behind an object in the shade does it get cold like you know that super cold of the vacuum of space etc just curious because that means we'd probably never find life anywhere else if it didn't have an atmosphere if that's the case uh, second question is related to um, the recent pictures of the sun. They look so great. It's amazing. Um, how do they protect the spacecraft when they the the uh, craft that's getting so close to the sun? I'm sorry, I can't remember the name at the moment. How do they actually protect that thing from cook, being cooked? Um, interesting stuff. Thanks, as always. Great show. Bye. Aluminium foil. <laughs> Aluminum foil, sorry. Got to talk American sometimes on this show. Uh, No, I don't know. Uh, But good questions. Uh, That first one about uh, temperature uh, is interesting. Of course, we're on the other side of the planet and um, uh, aside from all the dirt from the north falling on top of us as a consequence of that, uh, it's... um, we're going into the cooler months, so we're seeing we're having the opposite. We're having little cold snaps and, and things like that at the moment, and then we sort of rebound into some warmer weather, and then it drops again. So you're having the opposite happen. But uh, the effect of uh, you know on a hot sunny day walking under a tree and feel, feeling cooler is also something that happens on a planet wide scale, isn't it, Fred? Uh, that, yes, that's right. So um, uh, um, I mean, Ralph. Uh, he's hit that nail on the head, really, uh, in that to feel the sun's heat, you've got to have something that feels it. Uh, and in in the case of uh, the Earth, uh, it's both the atmosphere, which is heated by the sun's radiation, and the surface, which also gets heated by the sun's radiation. But but um, I think Ralph's um, assessment that to have living organisms, you you need an atmosphere it's probably about right as well mm. because the what the atmosphere does is it, uh, it 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 regulates the temperature on the surface of the planet if you think of the moon um which is devoid of an atmosphere or any atmosphere to speak of it's got something called an exosphere which is you know a few atoms per cubic meter um but not not enough to make a, any difference to the heat of this uh, this the um the, the that you'd feel on you were there. Um, it's the surface of the moon itself uh, that when it's on the daylight side, it gets very hot. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something in the region of 150 degrees Celsius. It might even be a bit higher. Wow, really? On the surface, yeah. Uh, and on the night side, it drops to a similar number below zero. It's 130 or 170, something. I can't remember the exact figures, but it's of that order. There's something like a 300 degree Celsius a range of temperatures and and it's because there's no atmosphere there so uh on the day side uh, the sun is warming up the surface with this incessant heat and the, the surface temperature goes up on the night side 
all that heat's being radiated out into space because there's nothing to stop it. There's no, you know, blanket of air that, that actually prevents that. And, it, and the same is true of spacecraft. If you've got a spacecraft up there, that it's got a day side and a night side, and the designers of, uh, you know, of spacecraft have got to think very carefully about the thermal balance, about how you balance this heat. Uh, you know, heat influx on one side and heat loss by radiation on the other. And so there's a lot of clever engineering goes into those spacecraft to, to allow that to happen. Yeah, I, re I remember when it was at Skylab had a bit of a problem and they had to create a, um, a shield. They, they made some kind of umbrella. Was that Skylab? Uh, it might have been, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that's right, um, going, going back to those days. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't realise the temperatures got so high on the moon. How did the astronauts Well, cope? they um, – so all the lunar landings were in – I mean, remember the, the, the daytime on the moon. They lasts chose for, temperate for, zones. Well, yes. For, so the daytime lasts for 14 days. Um, the sun's above the horizon for 14 days on the moon. <laughs> And what they did was they uh, they landed early in the solar day, so the moon, the sun was still relatively low, and right. not heating the you know the surface up to these incredible levels. Um, and you're right; it depends on where you are. You, 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 they were in relatively temperate zones, uh, but it was the choosing the early morning moon time uh which kept the temperatures controllable and of course they had heat insulating boots and all the rest of it to, to stop the, their feet burning yeah fascinating fascinating uh so that sort of answers the question about temperature yeah um but uh the sun observing spacecraft and we were talking about one last week that's actually been grazing the outer atmosphere of the that's sun that's right how does it not get destroyed what's protecting it that's right so i think what ralph's talking about is the um, parker solar probe yeah uh, which was the first spacecraft to fly into the solar corona the the sun's outer atmosphere and quite low into it as well mm. uh now <clears throat> i've got the wikipedia page open in front of me for the parker solar good old probe. wiki <laughs> good old wiki yeah um the the incident solar radiation that it feels when it's nearest to the sun is here you go 650 kilowatts per, per square meter now if you think of you know you think of a one a one kilowatt heater which we all used to have uh and you're a meter away from it you know what heat comes of that this is 650 of those per square meter of surface area yeah. which is about 475 times the sun's intensity at earth orbit so it is really hammering down uh -huh. uh, onto the spacecraft but it's fitted with a heat shield uh it's hexagonal it's made of a reinforced carbon carbon composite uh and <clears throat> can withstand temperatures outside of about 1370 degrees celsius or two and a half thousand degrees fahrenheit um with a white alumina reflective surface to you know to minimize the absorption and when you think about it andrew that's not that surprising because when a spacecraft re-enters into the earth's atmosphere from orbit it's got a heat shield that's withstanding similar temperatures to that yeah uh, and that's just the standard you know like on um, uh, on well the space shuttle uh on the apollo spacecraft the um SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft, they've all got these heat shields mm. that can withstand these very high temperatures. So it's not that surprising that you can do it uh, with a spacecraft uh, that is, is flying next to the sun. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and those tiles that the, um, the, the they used on the, on the space shuttles, uh, you can heat them up and immediately put your hand on them and yeah, they just nothing. radiate the heat away. That's They're right. They're amazing. Yeah. yeah, I've actually held one. My my son's got one. He got it from um, oh. a fellow who used to, who used to work for NASA, who sent it to him as a secret Santa on on the Reddit fantastic. platform. Fantastic! Whoa, that's fantastic. So I, they thing. came with a warning: do not lick. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's got some pretty nasty stuff in yeah, it. it. Probably has, yeah. Mm. But yeah. this was a discarded one. There was something wrong with it, so they couldn't use it in the program. So yeah, it just fantastic. sort of got put on the discard pile. They have a pile of bricks out the back of NASA, all black and white. <laughs> I don't know, but um, yeah, it was fascinating. He's still got that at home somewhere, but uh, yeah, and so very light. Yeah, it, it, it's like picking up styrofoam. Yeah, quite incredible. 
Mm. Thank you, Ralph. Hope we answered all of your questions. Uh, appreciate that. And if you have any questions for us, don't forget to send them in. You can do that on our website via the Send Us Your Voice Message tab on the right-hand side, or you can click on the AMA tab up the top and send us a text question or a voice message. We are happy either way. Love to hear your voices, though. Don't forget to tell us who you are. Uh, and, of course, um, yeah, keep those questions coming in and we'll use them in future episodes. Not so sure we'll be using those recorded questions next week because it's a live program uh, celebrating our 300th episode. So I hope you can join us next week. We will be taking questions probably via Facebook. We'll let you know uh, on social media in the lead up and on the day. But uh, we're going to try and basically take some ad hoc questions uh, via Facebook if you want to send them in to us. I'll be monitoring Facebook uh, from my office and uh, I'll we'll throw some questions at Fred. I'll screen them as I go. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, and plenty of other things happening on the day. We'll be doing some giveaways. We'll be uh, you know, talking about bits and bobs, throwing in some bloopers. Uh, we'll have a few choice topics in there as well. Now, uh, a reminder again, again of where and when to listen. We'll be live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, Facebook and YouTube. If there are any more that we can add to that, we will let you know on social media. And uh, it will be at 11.30 p.m. International Universal Time on Monday. That is Monday of next week. So um, what time that is locally, you'll have to calculate by converting international time to your local time zone. So Monday, the 11th of April at 23.30 International Universal Time. Uh, or international time or universal time is its official um, uh, uh, title, I suppose. So universal time, 11.30 p.m. Monday the 11th for a live edition, live broadcast, a live podcast, a live stream, whatever you want to call it, on Facebook and YouTube. Looking forward to having you join us then. Uh, Fred, as always, thank you so much. 299 down. <laughs> it's hard to believe, isn't it? How did we get it here, is. Andrew? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> anyway. Lots of patience, blood, sweat and tears and yeah, COVID. that's right. <laughs> a lot of people yeah. who seem to like what we do, which staggers me no end, but it's yeah, fabulous. So I, fabulous. Yeah, I think it's great. Fabulous. All right. Um, thanks, Fred. We'll catch you next week and uh, look for, looking forward to number 300. Sounds good. See you then. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts, and of course uh, Hugh back in the studio, who does everything that we don't, which is well nothing really. <laughs> but we thank him anyway. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, we look forward to your company next week, episode three hundred of Space Nuts. Until then, bye bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. <laughs> Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.